What's up, everybody, and welcome to Real Time for the Real Everyday Movie Fan. I'm Ryan Murphy, and it's my great honor and privilege to be here today with Academy Award-winning makeup designer, uh, John Calioni Jr. Mr. Calioni, thank you uh, very much for being with us here today. Did I get your name right? Did I pronounce it correctly? <laughs> well, you said it like Italian style, man. That's amazing. Calioni, it's, uh, I don't hear that very often. It's usually Caglione or Caglioni. Is that how you uh, pronounce it? Uh, you can call me Johnny. Uh, how about that? <laughs> okay. Sounds great. Just don't call me late for dinner. Just All don't right. call me late for dinner. <laughs> All right. Well, for those who don't know Mr. Mr. Cot or Johnny, for those who don't know Johnny, you're a, uh, um, you're a terrific makeup artist in, uh, in, in Hollywood. And uh, we'll get into the specifics about your, your wonderful career here in a bit. But first, I want you to just properly introduce yourself and tell us, you know, what made you decide to want to get into Hollywood and how you sort of broke into where you are uh, to, to, to being a, a, an artist in, in, in this system, I suppose. So uh, I guess in the very beginning, I, I just, um, at first I thought I was going to be a stop animator. Like this is probably like the early 70s. And I, you know, I think I'm a freshman in high school and I started to look at films like The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and the original King Kong, Willis O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, that was like, that just blew me away. You know, just a great work. So I, I started to study stop animation. And then uh, I, I started to watch Chaplin films, silent movies. And all this kind of like was happening at the same time. Uh, the Charlie Chaplin Film Festival was on PBS. And then that led me to Lon Chaney Sr., The Man of a Thousand Faces. Then I started picking up this magazine called Famous Monsters, a Filmland magazine. So it was kind of all in the mix very early on, uh, this thing about fantasy and movies. And then um, the movie The Exorcist came out. And, I, you know, that, that, was, that just, you know, I slept in my parents' room for two weeks. You know, it just, it just, you know, it scarred me, but it, uh, I had to find out who the makeup artist was and, and uh, it was Dick Smith. So, uh, you know, to me, he was like, if I'm studying to learn how to play the guitar as a kid, uh, I'm looking at this guy, he's like Jimi Hendrix to me. And so um, I, uh, I didn't know where Dick Smith lived. And uh, my mother had a gossip magazine this old Rona Barrett gossip magazine. And in the, this gossip magazine, there was the address for the Linda Blair fan club at Warner Brothers Studios in Hollywood. So I wrote a letter to Dick Smith, makeup artist, The Exorcist. I put big block lettering on it. And I think I drew a little caricature of Dick Smith with him, like a makeup brush in his hand, trying to make this envelope look ornate. And I mailed the letter and I mailed it to Hollywood. And about a month later, I'm playing football in the street with my friends. I, I think I'm about a, a sophomore or junior in high school at this time. And my mother yells, Johnny, Dick Smith's on the phone. And Dick Smith, the makeup artist from The Godfather, The Exorcist, actually called me on the phone. And that started a correspondence with Dick Smith. Um, eventually, he took me under his arm as a protege. And then uh, he recommended me to NBC television in New York in 1976 as I was graduating high school. They were looking for an apprentice. They were looking for an apprentice who could do this new show called Saturday Night Live, who had some effects background, who made some prosthetics and was young and uh, willing to work almost for nothing and start. So that was, that was my start, meeting Dick Smith and uh, getting my foot in the door at NBC in 1976 in television. That's fantastic. And so like uh, you worked on Saturday Night Live then for like, was that, that was about the first season or the, or the, or the you said 76 would have been the second season, I suppose. Yeah, 76 was the second season. I knew that I, I actually went down and I auditioned for, I brought my friend with me and I did a whole monster makeup on her, uh, Philippe Bacon, because I thought this was my only chance so just go for it. So I designed a, a foam latex makeup. And I think that was still, and we were still in 1975 because um, after I made up my, my friend who I brought down to New York, um, 
Lee hired me on the spot, Lee Big and the head of the makeup department. So before my senior year, going into my senior year, I knew that I had a job at NBC. So the first thing they did was they said, well, you got to come down and start observing the show. So the end of 75, I was taking the bus. I lived in upstate New York. So I would take the Trailways bus and I would go down to, uh, uh, to NBC at 30 Rock and I would observe the show uh, Saturday Night Live. I would see how, the, how it worked and then I'd jump on the bus and go home. So I did, I made about three or four uh, trips uh, before I graduated high school. And then in 1976, when I got out in June, July, I started at NBC. I mean, Saturday Night Live was the main show, but they had me as the apprentice and I uh, did all the shows on Saturday. First of all, I didn't even touch anybody really until like six months into my apprenticeship. I just observed that I made the occasional cone head or jumped in and did a ball cap on Saturday Night Live or something like that uh, for the first six months. And then after that, I started to gain traction at NBC. But, you know, writing that letter, I'll tell you, write letters because um, that one, le I, I explain this to people, that one letter to Dick Smith was like being stranded on a desert island and putting a note in a bottle and throwing it in the ocean. A, a, a miracle happened. It, it, somebody at Warner Brothers forwarded that letter to Dick Smith's house. Dick Smith had a basement workshop in Larchmont, New York, where he created all the makeup in The Exorcist, The Godfather, and all the movies. So some very nice person at, at Warner Brothers really connected me to Dick Smith. So write letters, make contact with people because miracles can happen. And that's a miracle. That is a miracle. Wonderful, wonderful. And so um, you worked on Saturday Night Live. I mean, any like, you know, really iconic uh, makeup jobs? You mentioned cone heads, stuff like that. I mean, I assume, uh, you know, you probably had, some, had a hand if not in prosthetics, at least in just making up people for some really famous uh, sketch sketches that were going on at that time. Yeah, well, you know, in those days, Saturday Night Live, the makeup and hair budgets were not what they are now. It, it was kind of like doing college theater. So you really, you know, if we had a cone head, which was, you know, already pre-made and I would make them out of the mold that Carl Fullerton, another great makeup artist that was at NBC, uh, he was actually on staff just before I came in. So I was right behind Carl. So Carl made the original cone heads and we had the molds. But other than the cone heads or a ball cap on John Belushi as a samurai or some, you know, maybe making some fake teeth, it was pretty much just working out of your kit on Saturday Night Live. But, you know, I, I was doing high school plays before I started in television. I was doing high school theater and then I came into Saturday Night Live and I had to like really learn, hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I had a lot of great help from the makeup artists on Saturday Night Live, but also uh, some of the girls, the talent on, on uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, Jane Curtin and Gilda Radner, they kind of showed me the ropes and where to be on the set and you know how to do live television. So I learned from the crew and some of the cast on Saturday Night Live. Great, and and so like as you you left, I don't know when you left Saturday Night Live. You can let me know, but um, then your first yeah. film credit was in 1982 on Friday the 13th, or 1980, uh, nine, nine, sorry, 1981 on uh, Friday the 13th Part Two. Um, so yeah. it was that, and then you did the like, Quest for Fire. After that, of course, the department heads on that film got the Oscar uh for for makeup yeah. and then so like what was that like breaking out into film and uh, was that around the same time you left Saturday Night Live that that happened yeah it was around that time you know I was on I think I was on staff at NBC from 76 so yeah about 82 81 82 I was on staff and um you know like I said we weren't just doing Saturday Night Live I was on staff so I did the news I did game shows uh yeah but then I uh Friday the 13th part two was a big break uh like I said Carl Fullerton great, great makeup artist. Um, he hired me to do Friday the 13th with him. Mm -hmm. And so I worked, uh, I re that's really re really where I learned how to do uh, prosthetic preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, it was through Carl Fullerton, he was a great mentor to me. So I worked with Carl, under Carl, on Friday the 13th part two. And then I did films like Quest for Fire, Zelig with Woody Allen, um, The Cotton Club, where Dutch Schultz wears a whole rubber nose and a whole big James Raymar. 
Um, so th those were the first steps moving into my career from television into film. Yeah. And so like, um, <clears throat> so as you, I'll as let, you get into I'll, this. I'll, I'll never forget, just one thing about Cotton Club, I'll never forget, um, Dick Smith actually recommended me to Francis Ford Coppola and Dick and I designed the Dutch Schultz makeup together. Mm -hmm. Dick made these beautiful dental plumpers that went inside James Raymar's mouth because they wanted him to look heavy, but not wear prosthetics because, you know, they didn't want to put him in makeup every day and spend hours getting him ready. So Dick made these plumpers that went in his mouth like Brando's dental plumpers, but they went all the way inside the inside of his cheeks. And then I made a rubber nose and I did that makeup every day, you know, uh, for Dick Smith. I was on set, the prosthetics guy on set, doing that and other makeups for Cotton Club. But the story I'm getting to is um, I actually had to go in and meet Francis Ford Coppola uh, being sponsored by Dick Smith. So we had a meeting at Astoria Studios in Queens. And here I am going in with Dick Smith, meeting Francis Ford Coppola, meeting Bob Evans, uh, the producer. These are the three men that created The Godfather. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think I'm 26 or 27 years old. And I just, you know, it's one of those moments in your life where you just realize, holy cow. I mean, I'm, this is pretty cool. I just hope I don't drop the ball here. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it all worked out. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's, I, that sounds pretty, pretty great. As a, especially as a Godfather fan myself and a, a Coppola fan and everything. Yeah. As a Coppola fan, I have never watched the Cotton Club. So you're going to make me watch it because in order to put what you just said into this interview, which the audience would have just seen the clip that I just put in the Cotton Club of the Cotton Club in this film, I would have had to actually watch it between now and editing the video. So thank you. You're, uh, you're forcing right. me to finally watch that yeah. movie. <laughs> I think you'll like it. They just re he did, uh, Coppola restored it and re-edited it. So he did a uh, like a redo of the Cotton Club. It's almost three hours long, but it's it's epic, man. It really is great. Really great film. Yeah, and uh, I mean it's 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 interesting for me because you're actually the second. I don't know if I told you this, but you're the second makeup artist I've, I've interviewed in the past week. Uh, earlier this week, I, I talked to Matthew Mungle, um, right. who uh, mentioned he's he's a friend of yours. Yeah. Um, yes. And I, I'll oh, say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll say the same thing that I, that I said to him, which was there's really, in, from a layman's perspective, there's kind of two kinds of makeup, which is there's just making people up, you know, like, okay, let's put some makeup on the actor because he has to be on camera versus prosthetics, like the real, like hardcore, like let's put a nose on someone or let's, you know, let's turn someone yeah. into, you know, I mean, like, so um, you mentioned the exorcist and wanted to get into that because of create the kind of sounds like the creation of movie monsters was really a huge thing for you. So it sounds like prosthetics was always a, a big um, goal for you. I mean, uh, was yeah, that really? Transformations. Yeah. Transformations, mm -hmm. right. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, just, I mean, like, so obviously though you do plenty of just, well, I think what Mongol called uh, straight makeup, which is just simple, yep. you know, make. So, I mean, do, do you find uh, that, did you find that you were doing straight makeup in the day, but really had the ambition to get into prosthetics? um or were you just you know glad to be wherever you were in that in that world well early on it was just uh was more you know prosthetics and character work mm -hmm. uh you know but at nbc for six years i learned how to do beauty makeup mm -hmm. you know how to make up men and women sportscasters and newscasters and talent actresses um now in my life in my latter years in the business i've come to realize that when you're doing process it like there, I don't think there's any real delineation anymore <laughs> between beauty makeup and a fine uh, character makeup. Um, one discipline kind of informs the other. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to explain. Um, you know, in a in a fine beauty makeup on, like I did Emma Stone on a film or um, Jennifer Connelly. Um, you know, millimeters can be miles in a makeup, whether it's. A, a beautiful old age makeup, like in The Exorcist on Father Marin, this whole face is rubber. Mm -hmm. uh, or mm -hmm. a beautiful beauty makeup, like like on Jennifer Connelly. Uh, so it's all kind of in the mix. Colors, um, design ethic. I think it all kind of, it, it all crosses over somehow, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, um, 
I, I love doing all the kinds of makeup that I can. And you know, um, early on, it was a lot of character makeup, it was a lot of prosthetic monster makeup. Uh, but then my my career just, you know, it, it takes you, you know, I didn't really plan my career. Um, I didn't say, oh, I'm gonna do that and not do that. You just take the work. Mm -hmm. And over the years, it just evolved into um, character, beauty, prosthetics, straight makeup for men and women. It's all of it. Yeah. Well, uh, then, of course, the film that, uh, that uh, became a big thing for you was Dick Tracy, uh, yeah. which you did a lot of prosthetics on. And, of course, you ended up winning, you and uh, fellow artist Doug Drexler ended up winning the Oscar yeah. uh, for best makeup for those insane prosthetics that you did on everybody, and just the crazy heads and stuff like that, of course. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And so what was that like getting that job and then and then going through the process of like when you started to get awards for it and you realize, oh, we're going to like we might, we might get the Oscar for this. And then getting that award must have been that must have been a tremendous experience the whole from beginning to end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, we, Doug, Doug and I uh, had a shop in Brooklyn, in New York uh, years before that. And back in those days, like in the mid to late 80s. A lot of people didn't go to Hollywood to do movies from New York. So we, we really considered Dick Tracy a long shot. Uh, it was a miracle actually that, you know, it worked out and we got, we got the job. Uh, but I set up a meeting with Milena Cananero, the costume designer who I'd worked with on the Cotton Club. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew Milena from Cotton Club and I also know, knew Richard Silbert, who was the production designer on Cotton Club and Dick Tracy. So I had two good allies going in and we set up that meeting and we were, we happened to be in Los Angeles and um, they set up a meeting with Warren and we found ourselves in this beautiful mansion on Mulholland Drive meeting Warren Beatty. And I'll, I'll never forget it. We, we, I was just enjoying the day with a Hollywood movie star because I didn't really think we were going to get the movie. I mean, we really wanted to get it. But it was such a long shot. You know, everybody was going for the film, I'm sure. And um, we met with Warren. He was very nice. We met him for about an hour. And as I was walking out of his house, he stopped me. He says, um, Caglione, Cagli you don't think you're getting this movie, do you? And I was like, no, I don't think I'm getting He said, well, listen, hold on a minute. He went and he got the script. And he said, I want you to read the script. And uh, you and Doug, you go back to your hotel and uh, break it down and come back tomorrow and give me a, you know, give me a pitch, give me a proposal. So Doug and I stayed up all night. We did sketches, little thumbnail sketches based on the comic strip. And uh, we went back the next day and we did our, we met with Warren. He was lovely. And um, like a week or two later, we were up in Canada on a job. Um, and at like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, my phone rings in the hotel room. And it's John Landau, the producer. And he's, he just, uh, I'm half asleep and I'm hello. And he says, uh, Johnny, this is John Landau. I just wanted to call and tell you that you were awarded Dick Tracy, congratulations. Now you can go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and we're jumping on the bed, you know, just. And it was a, it was a big break for us. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's another miracle. There's yeah. two. But then you, uh, yeah. Dick Tracy, it just, you know. But, but then do you remember like getting, like when you started, like a war season started coming along and you started getting nominations and stuff like that. And then, I mean, was there a moment where you're like, like, oh my gosh, we could win the Oscar for this. And then of course getting the nomination and then the Oscar. Uh, you know, as we, that's my dog. Do you hear my Australian Shepherd back Oh, but there? it's fine, yeah. <laughs> I think he hears your voice in here. He thinks he's a stranger. Um, you know, when we were actually working on Dick Tracy and hip deep in it, uh, it didn't really cross my mind that we were going to win an Academy. I, honestly, I swear to God, it didn't because you're so involved in it. Um, but uh, toward the end, when we were finishing up, there were people were saying, oh, you know, you, you might get nominated and you know, you're, the dust is settling. You can kind of see daylight. Mm -hmm. And we had seen what we had done. We had a great crew. And then we started to go, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we'll get, maybe we'll get the nom. And, uh, you know, uh, 
There it is, you know, there's the third miracle right there, baby. And the Oscar goes to John Caglione Jr. and Doug Drexler for Dick Tracy. Well, we'd like to thank God. We'd like to thank the members of the Academy. Dick Tracy was a character makeup artist's dream come true. That's right. Thank you, Warren Beatty, for taking a chance on two guys from Brooklyn. Melina Cannonero, who never let Warren forget that we were out there. Vittorio for his wonderful cinematography. And Dick Silver for his unerring artistic support. The actors who suffered countless applications of glue and rubber, the talented makeup artists, our wonderful lab crew, thank you. We'd also like to thank Barry Osborne. Thank you, John Landau, our guardian angel. Jeffrey Katzenberg, all the good folks at Disney and Touchstone, Chester Gould and the Gould family, and especially our own families. Helen. My wife Donna, who stood by us through thick and thin. Thank you, incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. So let me ask you, um, uh, you know, the question I want to ask all Oscar winners that I talk to, which is, where do you keep your Oscar? Um, I have it in my living room. I have it right there, not far from my television. And, uh, you know, I have the British Oscar there and, and an Emmy that I won for uh, Al Pacino's makeup uh, in Angels in America. So, yeah, it's it's there. So we're the, very, uh, we're very yeah. proud, very proud, you know. Well, Man, yeah, I, never, I, I mean, I never thought that that would happen. You know, honestly, I'm not just being falsely. Mind. I mean, who even dreams about that stuff? You know? I may have I may have dreamed about that once or twice. <laughs> but but the other great thing about Dick Tracy was I believe it was your first film with Al Pacino. And over the years, yeah. just going through your IMDb profile, it's impossible not to notice. Like it seems pretty obvious that he's asking for you, that he's getting you on with him on some of the like yeah. look at Johnny. Johnny, Johnny's my makeup guy. Like, is that yeah. did that relationship start with Dick Tracy? Did you guys become friends on that movie? And, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, th th yeah. It started with Dick. that's the first time I'd ever uh, met Al and uh, and worked with him. But you know, it's been amazing to me that he's called me ever since. Pretty much on most of the jobs he's done since that. So, um, just unbelievable. I don't know how it works or why, but yeah, you know, hell, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll be there. No problem. No problem, Al. <laughs> Well, I did. I what did an, an honor. Interview. That's an yeah. honor. I did an interview with a guy named Stephen Morrow, who's a sound mix, production sound mixer. Great job. Great at his job. Um, uh, Oscar nominee. And he uh, he said something. Uh, I'm forgetting the exact words, but he said something about like, getting getting rehired and getting a, a reputation, getting being successful is like 40 percent talent and being good at your job and 60 percent just being a cool guy, being a good guy, like being someone that people want to have have around. You know, so I probably, I mean, it's probably a good portion of it that Al, like Al just likes you, you know, in addition to you being very talented. I, well, thank you. That's very kind. I, you know, I, I don't know. How, I guess it's like, you know, um, being a, a side guitar player in Eric Clapton's band or something. I, you know, you just, you're just a good side man and it works for the, for the, uh, the star. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't understand really how it works. But um, yeah, it's just, uh, I guess we get along real well. Um, um, yeah, I just respect him so much. I mean, you're a God, I'm a Godfather fan too. Sure. And so, uh, you know, that's, it's unbelievable that I get a chance to work with Al Pacino and then see what he does mm -hmm. uh, or, and help him in some way. It's just yeah. amazing to me. Yeah. And, uh, I don't understand how I, I don't understand how it works, Ryan. Honestly, but um, thank God it does. Yeah. The uh, the other thing is uh, obviously just kind of going through your filmography. Like, what what what, what kind of films would, would be cool to talk about? Uh, obviously, there's The Dark Knight, which was your second Oscar nomination. I'll get to that in a second. But you yeah. also did The Departed in 2006, which is another fantastic film. 
what were some of the effects were some of the makeup that you did on that movie was it just straight makeup or did you kind of do some of the bullet holes in people's heads and stuff like that or yeah yeah with all of the above i was a department head and I enjoy being department head on, especially like The Departed, because you could, I do Vera Farmiga's beauty makeup. She's beautiful. Anyway, she makes you look good. Um, and then you do, uh, I do a couple of dead guys they find in a field, you know, with uh, eight ball hemorrhages on the eye. That's a funny story because um, in the script, it said, uh, we find these two dead guys face down mm -hmm. in this swampy area in Boston. But I knew that, I knew the one stunt guy, Johnny, and I, I, I didn't know the other guy, but um, I said, let me put the, I had stock like swollen eyes and bullet wounds. And I just wanted to do this really hemorrhaged, you know, makeup and with these shots in the face. And we guided Johnny, the stunt guy down because he could barely see out of these swollen eye prosthetics. Mm -hmm. And we guided him down. And I remember seeing Scorsese off to the side. He wasn't at all expecting this makeup. They were face down in the script. And I was really like a nervous wreck. Like I, I'm doing something that's the director has no clue uh, what's going on here. And Scorsese looked at it. He goes, I got to shoot these face up. They have to be face up. This is great. And so I was like, you know, <laughs> you know and uh, they shot it face up in the, in the swamp, in this uh, marsh. And uh, that's the way it went on on the whole movie. It was, you know, incredible to work with Martin Scorsese. I mean, you know, just unbelievable, you know, just amazing. But I was nervous walking that makeup to the set. But thank God he liked it and it all worked out. But yeah, The Departed was great. You got to do bruises and cuts and blood and beauty makeup and more blood and some more beauty makeup and more blood. It was it was perfect for me. Yeah. And, and the, uh, you know, obviously, like you said, Scorsese, um, you talked about meeting Coppola and everything and what an experience that was. And, and just that, that, that must've just been another, just one more starstruck moment for you where it's like, okay, now I'm making a Marty Scorsese motion picture. You know? Yeah. Just try to be calm, Johnny. Just try to be calm. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, but then the, uh, then the dark night happened and that got you your second Oscar nomination. Now your particular credit on that film is as Mr. Ledger's um, makeup artist. And so I was trying to think of like what questions to ask about the Dark Knight, and what what occurred to me, I mean that obviously it got a nomination, so I mean you did a heck of a job. But the thing that occurred to me is like that's not necessarily prosthetics; it's, it's the makeup that the character is supposed to be wearing within the context of the film. But the challenge that yeah. would seem to me, from my perspective, for you, that that would have been your challenge would have been continuity, like the 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 having that smear, smeared makeup in all the right in all the same smeared places it, it, for multiple days and stuff like that must have been the, the, the real challenge with that film if I'm not wrong. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, how did it look to you to look all right? Looked pretty good to me. I mean, it's... oh, thank God. <laughs> and that that um, I got to tell you that that Halloween, October 2008, you could not throw a pencil without hitting a Joker. The Jokers were everywhere. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, like, they were like putting Joker on like different people, you know, politicians yeah. and everyone. Uh, it was wild. I did a couple of Joker makeups at Halloween when I came home on Friends, you know. So I, I remember how popular that was. Um, but yeah, continuity, man. You know, it's like so, some scenes we shot in Chicago, we'd finish in London, and you know, vice versa. So a little tricky, um, but. If you hit those big marks, kind of, I found, then you're, you're kind of, you, nothing really matched, honestly. But uh, if you could get it in the ballpark, then it looked pretty, you were pretty safe. Did you use yeah. like stencils or like anything to make no. sure? You no, 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 it was all freehand every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would do the makeup on, Heath was great. I mean, sure. that performance, I could have put a Boston cream pie on his face and it would have looked great. You know, I would have, he was so amazing. So, uh, you know, that's, that's really the magic. Mm -hmm. You just get past the makeup. Really. You're yeah. looking at that incredible performance by Heath. So you can forgive anything that's going on. You just forget it. It reminded me of um, when I saw the elephant man, the movie, mm -hmm. and I started to go to look at the makeup as a makeup artist. But the performance by John Hurt back then and the movie, 
you don't even look at the makeup anymore. You just accept it because the acting is so great, the story is so great, you just get past it. And you're looking at story and character. Mm -hmm. And so um, that probably saved me from the continuity issues. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's great. And of course, they, I mean, everyone says the same thing is that which is that Heath Ledger was just a, a wonderful person on set. And, and like, you know, they've talked to actors and they said that he would just, you know, as soon as the camera stopped rolling for as much of a method actor as he had was known for, he was just all laughs once the camera stopped rolling. I mean, I'd, I'd imagine you would you know that as well as anyone. Yeah, I mean, it, I, you know, I was around him a lot, almost all the time on set, uh, if not all the time. And he was having a good time all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just, he, he made it look like effortless. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they've, I've read stories where, oh, he was dark or he got, you know, there was none of that. He was just dancing through that movie, on set, off set, uh, big hugs every morning when he came in, big hugs every night, never missed. Just a great vibe, man. Just incredible. You, you could be creative. That's the one thing with these great, great actors like Pacino, uh, Johnny Depp, um, Heath Ledger, is that they help you relax. Yeah. Because you're so close to them. You know, you're the man, you're this, this, I'm the, and like you're they're as close to me as the screen but even mm -hmm. closer almost all day you try to stay out of their face as much as possible only doing for close-ups but um the great actors make you relax so that you can bring your game and uh and you your work you know it, it's all better for it i've been very lucky with these great amazing iconic actors and that's one thing that i've learned from them is just to try to relax well, yeah, and then you, uh, that, uh, sorry, you, you try moving past that, and you, uh, yeah. you, as as you move on with your career, you've done amazing things. You've done the Amazing Spider Man two, um, you know. Yeah, I'm just, all over the place. So yeah, I'm the Irishman. Place. The Irishman must have been, you know, like going just, you know, I, I imagine that was Al bringing you back in to, to work with yeah. him and everything. But also yeah. your second time working with Scorsese and everything, and um, yeah, so uh, must have been. I mean, that's that's. I mean, I just talked to Matt Mungle, who did De Niro's stuff, and you did Pacino's stuff in that movie. So now I feel like I have the the, the set, the set of makeup artists for the Irish. <laughs> All we need is Brando now. We've got Pacino, De Niro, Brando. Actually, I did work with Brando one time. Yeah, really. Uh, what was that on? It was a film called The Brave that Johnny Depp directed, right after we did Donny Brasco. It was oh, I never heard of this. Of Johnny Depp directed a movie with Marlon Brando in it? I've... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, so, yeah, he we did Donnie Brasco, which was another great film to be on. Sure. That was amazing. Just one of the top five, like, most fun films, best projects to work on personally for me. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, Johnny Depp, we did Donnie Brasco, and then he asked me to do The Brave, this little indie film that he directed and produced. And Brando was in it. It's pretty amazing. It's really cool. Depp and Brando. <laughs> yeah. Not too shit. Yeah. There you go. Um, well, I mean, talk about the Irishman, and, and uh, you know, that was as recent as 2019. Now, as we come to, kind of to the modern day, um, what I usually do is ask people, you know, about what they're what they have in the future. Now, you on your IMDb page, you have a movie coming out called um, Cabrini. Now. Yeah. As a Catholic, I have to ask about this because you know it's Saint Francis Cabrini, the first uh, first American saint. Uh, what, uh, what are we? Uh, what's 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 this prime? I haven't heard about this before. I looked you up and started looking at this. So uh, what's going on yeah. now? Well, it's it's Mother Cabrini, her life. Uh, it's an incredible story. Um, she came to this country. Uh, she came to the Five Points, and you know, shanty town. You know, just squalor. And she built the first orphanages for Italians living and struggling in the streets. Um, you know, it was slavery, man, you know, of a different kind in those days. It's just an epic story of her life uh, coming into this country. She only lived to like, I think 1917. Mm -hmm. um, she actually died on Our Lady of Fatima, the appearance of Our Lady that year, ironically. But, um, just an incredible story about this woman who 
you know, and she, 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 she says it in her bios and in the movie. I mean, the woman was on a mission from God. I mean, she was taking orders directly from the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's all in this movie. They don't pull any punches. And uh, I think it's going to be a cool, cool little film. I really do. It's great to work on. You know, we did um, lots of different character makeups. I can't really say much about it because it's still pending. Uh, Is it shooting out. right now or are you just getting No, ready? we're done. We, we, we finished about, I think about seven, eight months ago. Okay. Uh, but um, Alejandro, uh, the director, he shot in the style of um, The Revenant, the, the director of The Revenant, where it's mm -hmm. all one kind of scene with stitching. And mm -hmm. so everything's set up like a portrait painting. It's beautifully shot and lit. A really interesting project and a great story. You know, just uh, Mother Cabrini, just amazing what she did. It's miraculous, really. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I'll have yeah. to get some some friends yeah. from church to go to go check that out. Is there anything else that you're uh, that you're working on? Yeah, that, that, sure. that, that... <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else? Close to God, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I've got something that's you know coming up. And I don't want to really, I, I don't believe in talking it away because <laughs> uh, that can happen, but uh, it's a really great project, great script uh, with a director I've worked with a few times. He's just one of the greatest directors of all time. And um, so I'm, you know, <laughs> hopefully very soon. Well, I, I would ask, um, uh, you know, what, what advice you have for people? That's usually how I close this out. Uh, you kind of already said, like, write letters, right? Like, if you're trying to get into the industry, write letters, miracles can happen. So, is there anything yeah, else? I mean, just let people know how you feel. You know, I think this whole thing, you know, today, it's like everyone's kind of disconnected. I mean, in my experience, what I see, uh, you know, they, they're on the phone and they're, you know, you're, it's the phone and the person. and But just connect to people mm -hmm. because there's people out there that really want to help. And I got a lot of help from a lot of people. I mean, I'm here because of Dick Smith and there's just Al Pacino and just so many people that I can't even, they don't, they don't even come to mind. So um, I just believe that we all wouldn't survive, we wouldn't survive very long without the help of others. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Fantastic. That's, that's a great thing to go out on. And Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Calioni Jr., a wonderful makeup artist, Oscar winner in Hollywood. What did you think of the interview? Let us know what you thought. Let us know if you have any other questions. Maybe we'll we'll we'll, we'll come back and visit with him again. Uh, and uh, I hope so. <laughs> and until next time, I'm Ryan Murphy, and thank you for keeping it real with Real Time.